It is so good to be in God's house together to worship with each and every one of you. And even those joining us online, I love to say welcome home. Uh, we're so grateful that you took the time to worship with us. And for those who are in person, you know, it is always different when we come on out together. Uh, but I want to I take this moment just to acknowledge if there is any one of you with us for the first time, I just want to say a special welcome to you. Uh, come on, uh, community, let's give a good warm welcome to those joining us for the first time in person as well as online. We ask one thing uh, from you is that we're not going to ask you to stand or anything like that, uh, but you would have gotten a connection card with your worship guide. Uh, we just ask that you fill that out just to let us know, hey, it was your first time you visiting with us and someone from our team would reach out just to see if there's any way that we can serve you. As I always try to remind you guys, listen, if you are going through something and you need that prayer, you need that support, use the connection card for that. We definitely cover you guys in prayer. But if there's something specific that we can help with, as a church, we would love to stand with you. So you can, even if it's not your first time, I'm just saying you can use the connection card for that as well. Uh, for those who may not know who I am, um, my name is John Paul and with my lovely wife Sarah and our family, uh, we uh, have the privilege to serve and to lead here at Hope City for this season, amen? And it's been a pleasure so far, it's been up and down, but God has been faithful, amen? Uh, come on, and we, we are so grateful we get to do this, uh, we, it is a privilege for us to stand and to serve you guys in this role. I got to shout out our amazing dream team and especially those um, who've been working so hard for the past several weeks in our outreach department. Man, they pulled out an excellent... We, we, we as a community had our first health fair for the central area yesterday. <laughs> I hope my numbers are right, but I know we served over 120 people in helping provide free health care, free consultations. Listen, so for everyone who served our dream team, listen, they gave of their time, their treasure, their talents, but also by extension, all the professionals who did partner with us, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you for making a difference, for giving of their time. Uh, yesterday to serve the community. Amen. We, we believe our church is not within these four walls. Amen? Amen. And so, man, I'm so grateful. And for everyone that supported, maybe you weren't there, uh, but you gave through this ministry. Uh, it is your support. It is your generosity that helps us to make a difference. Amen. Amen. So we're definitely grateful for that. Um, I usually challenge everyone those online, in person as well, hey, do us a big favor. If you uh, enjoy Hope City, even if it's your first time and the worship was, you know, good enough, right? Uh, you could partner with us one easy way. Uh, you could share the service right now at Hope City TT. We live in a digital world, that's all. It's not a shameless plug. Uh, I have no shame in wanting to preach the gospel to as many people until all have heard. The good news of Christ. And that's one of our, our core values here at Hope City. We want to preach the gospel. We want to disciple the body of Christ. Yeah, and so if you're joining us for the first time, it's an interesting time to join us because <laughs> we've reached the end of what seems like a never-ending series <laughs> that we've walked through the book of Philippians. We've, we've spent the last eight weeks in this book, but it feels like more because we had Easter in between there. So it's 10 services. And um, the truth is we've just been walking through the book verse by verse more or less. It's definitely not um, an extensive study, but the truth is as a church, one of the strongest core values that we have here is we believe in the word of God and that as followers of Jesus, we should be in spending that time in the Word of God. Amen? And so we took the time to walk through ever so often. We try to do it twice for the year. 
where we take a book in the Bible and we just walk through it. And we let God's word speak to us. Amen. And so, if you're joining us for the first time, the book of Philippians, let me just give you some quick context. It's really a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church in Philippi. So the name Philippians just simply re represents the people from an area called Philippi. Yeah, you know, like how we are Trinidadians, that's all it is. And so it's a letter to this church in that area. The beautiful thing about this is that throughout the letter, Paul is encouraging the church to rejoice and to have joy and to be glad. And it's interesting he's encouraging them to do that because his own circumstances were a bit dire. He was actually in prison writing this letter and he wasn't sure that he would live throughout his trial. And so it's powerful for a man of God to be writing to the church, telling them to rejoice when his situation seems so bleak. One of the other things that we pulled from this letter that we saw, and I've said this from week one almost every week, but this letter was a thank you letter to the church for their generosity to Paul. You see, the church had supported him, uh, they were generous to him, and they sent a gift, yes, a financial gift to him, and he was writing this letter to say thank you. And today's actual message, he actually reveals that. So if you've been hearing me saying that and saying, well, Jay, we almost reached the end of the book and we didn't see that part, today you're actually going to see that he actually writes a lot about that. In everything, we've reached the end of it. And the part that Paul goes into today is really the generosity of these saints. And I'm going to hit this off the front end because I know this. Whenever you hear, for many of you, whenever you hear in church the topic of generosity or giving, it probably robs you the wrong way because of maybe some of the experiences you've had. And if your view of generosity or giving when it comes to the church is based on what you see on television, then I know for sure this, this is going to be you know, a tense moment. But I want to show you, listen, we're not picking up any special offering or anything. All right? The truth is, we've just reached this part in the book, and it talks about generosity. Come on. But here's my heart for you today. Paul ends this letter with one of the most famous verses if you've been in church. And it simply is this, that your God will provide. My hope for us today as a community is that for many of us, we struggle and wrestle around some level of provision in our lives. Oh, you all set or what? I thought I, maybe I'm the only one, but, but for many of us, whatever area in our life, there's always a tension. There's always something that we are trying to figure out or find answers or solutions to when it comes to providing some form or fashion. My hope to, for you today is that your faith will be built up or uh, you know, encourage today that God is the one that provides all of your needs. Amen? So that you do less worrying and some more trusting. And so before we could get to the promise of provision, we got we to gotta walk through what Paul says. And let me be honest with you guys. He doesn't teach by instructing the church here about generosity or giving or provision. But how he speaks and how he writes this letter, he leads by example. And so I want us to look at the example of Paul to see if there are some things that when it comes to the provision that we are looking for or worrying about, maybe there are some examples in Paul's life that we can take that can help us through this journey. Amen? And so we're going to pick up right where we left off. Philippians chapter 4. It's in your worship guide. You can follow along. And our team would have the scriptures up here as well. 
Philippians chapter 4 verses 10 to 14 where we begin. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked an opportunity to act. Not that I speak from need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Verse 12, I know how to get along with little, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry. Both of having abundance and suffering need. And one of the most quoted verses, verse 13. I can do all things through difficulty. There's a lot happening here that Paul is talking about, right? But we can recognize that one of the main themes in these couple verses... It is the Apostle Paul's amazing state of being contented. He begins by talking to the church and saying, Listen, I'm glad that you revived your concern for me. But he doesn't say that as a reproach. Because he actually adds that this church has always been looking for opportunity to bless him. I don't get, don't get caught up on the fact that you know, he's talking about a church blessing the leader. Don't get caught up on that. Here's why. Because Paul goes into something that I think is the greater message for us today. Paul says, I'm not speaking to you this way because I have a need. He says, because I have learned how to live in contentment, whether I have little or whether I have much. Let me say it to you this way. Paul's example is pushing us how we should live with contentment. That's your, first, that's your first note that I want you to wrestle with. How we should live with contentment. And here's something that I know has been even a struggle for myself, but I'm sure for many of you. When we hear the word contentment, it is. It usually leans to the side of lack. So many of us, we don't have contentment because there is something in our life that we lack. Come on. There's something that we are believing or trusting God or even just trying to work towards. There is some gap in your life or perceived gap. That keeps us in a place that we are not contented. Let me challenge you a different way then. This is something for you to think on and meditate on. Where you and I are right now in our lives. With whatever lack. With whatever you want from God. Whatever more you want. Right now some of you. If not all of us. We are in a position that we prayed for years ago. Because there were times and seasons you couldn't even do the basics. And where we find ourselves today is testimony of what God has already done. But we don't feel that way. We don't feel that way. Why? Because there's something in us. And I want to say this to you. This is not just this is part of the depravity of human nature. But we live in a society that feeds that appetite. That we must have more. We must have better. We must have greater. Man, we are the most advertised, most bombarded generation when it comes to wanting more. So if you could agree that you are stand or sitting in a position... In your life right now, that years ago or maybe just even last year, or let, let's even take it, during COVID, that you prayed prayers that God has you where you are today. Shouldn't we be more contented? But the, the heart and the lack 
that we wrestle with. Now listen, don't get me wrong. If you have vision and you have goals, you have aspirations to achieve more, to acquire more, to better your family, don't give up on that, you know. But that contentment has to be there as the foundation. Else we lose ourselves running after stuff. That's why Paul says, listen, I have learned how to be content. It's not a default behavior or attitude. Come on, you with me? And so I'm challenging you to question the lack in your life. And I'm going to say this, even for some of us who do have that lack, by the Spirit of God, He can give us that contentment. Because I'm not going to pretend that there are authentic needs in this house or even online. That you probably have something definitely that is a lack or a need. But I'm saying to you, that even in that state, God can give you contentment. As a matter of fact, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, this should be the default of every believer. Not because Paul said so, but because he lived it. Come on. The greatest way to lead is by example. Come on. And he's talking about the generosity of a church Yet he's making that statement. Listen, if you believe like us, that the word of God is inspired by God himself, it is God's word, there is no error, then it was no mistake that Paul wrote what he wrote. Two verses that I want to challenge you with when it comes to you processing lack in your life to help us fight to be in that state of contentment. Matthew 6, 32, 33. To 33, famous verse, the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. Let me give you the context. Right before that, Jesus was talking about shelter, food, provision, the basics to life. And he says, why are you worrying about these things that your heavenly Father will provide for you? Here's what he goes on to say, verse 33, but seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things, all the things that you need for life. I ain't telling you your, your desires or your wants. I'm talking about your needs. Come on. Because some of us feel like we have lack, but God has provided everything we need. He says, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and then these things will be pro provided to you. If you're taking notes, there's just one word I want you to think about when you processing your lack or the place where you want more set the right order set the right order before you begin to pursue more bigger better before you decide to pursue the increase that you perceive as what you need in your life right now put God first put his kingdom first The context is in church. So I'm not going to make apologies for that. If you've been with us for several weeks, listen, y'all, I, I feel in real bad if it's your first time here. Only. <laughs> if you all know, this church don't talk about wanting anything. Let, let me say this to you straight. When we started this church, we made a pact that this, we will always want something for you, not something from you. And we never stand here needing anything. But I am challenging you in your personal way that you deal with your finances, your wealth, and that pursuit of it. Seek first the kingdom of God. So before you make the plans and stuff, ask God, is there something I can do to advance your kingdom? The order has to be right. If you are going to fight and to be in that place of contentment, the order in which you do things has to be corrected. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 7, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. Come on. 
For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. That's a hard matter. That's a matter of revelation that every one of us have to fight for. We read that and we can agree easily up here that that is true. That you didn't come in this world with anything and you're not leaving with it. Yet we live like we're leaving with everything. You also with me? <laughs> but I want you to remember verse 13 what Paul says. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have butchered that scripture to use it for all kind of things. But today we're keeping it in context. He is proclaiming that he can do all things. What is the all things? Be contented. This drive for contentment starts with you deciding to give God thanks and praise for what he's already done. But the way that you guard your heart and your mind is only done through the power of Christ. That's what Paul gave us there. Because that scripture that we like to use, I can do all things through Christ, and you're running after a new promotion, you want to get something new, this, that, the other, struggling, fighting. Listen, I'm not saying those things don't apply to it sometimes. But the context here, this man, the apostle, the man of God, just told us that he has learned how to be contented in lack or in great prosperity. And the way he says it, I can do all things through Christ. Because here's the thing that we keep underestimating. We underestimate our own heart to put more trust in material things than in God. And it only takes the power of God to keep us on that track. So he didn't just talk about lack. The second part that he spoke about was, listen, I've learned to be content when I have abundance as well. A lot of times we live uh, with a focus about, when we, when we hear contentment, we think a lot of the times that, it is a focus of not complaining when we don't have the things that we want sometimes, right? But we miss the temptation to squander and even mishandle the seasons of plenty. You see, contentment is not only for people who have lack or don't have everything they have. One of the greatest failures of the body of Christ is when we are blessed. You look throughout scripture, the children of God in the Old Testament, they would run after God when they were persecuted, when they were in need. But when they were blessed, every time, it used to be a stumbling block. Some of us, the devil will bless us to hell quicker than fight you with luck. Because when we are blessed and in seasons of plenty, we do forget God. Paul says contentment is not just for when you have lack, but during your seasons when God blesses you. You all understand why I say we we should be living with our contentment? So whatever side of the spectrum you find yourself in, I think all of us, we need to examine our lives to see where we've lost contentment, whether in the pursuit for more or the mishandling of what God has placed in our hands. Let me say this to you. You are called to steward not just finances, but your time, your energy, your focus. When we stand before God, we will give an account of everything that is our lives. And I'm saying to you that, yes, the message is God provides. But you would never give him that praise or you would never even see that provision if your heart and your eyes are set to only want more. Because as many of us have recognized already, God has already provided. Come on. He's been real good to us. Five years ago, ten years ago, 
you aren't anywhere close to where you were. Is there anybody who can give him some praise just for 10 seconds? God, you've been faithful. You've been good to us. Hebrews 13, 5 says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Being content with what you have, for he himself said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever abandon you. My quick point for this is simple. When it comes to excess or having plenty, prioritize God's presence over possessions. The writer is warning us from the love of money. All right? That's something that's prevalent in our society. Even within some churches. Let's be straight. Yeah? But the answer to that is not hating money. It is the assurance that God is with you. You all may need to wrestle with that a bit. Meditate on that. It is not having less stuff or anything like that. Presence over possessions. You, sh- you and I need to pursue God's presence more. One of the things that I love uh, about this church, you know, there have been many seasons where there's been lack. And I've shared this throughout this series, different points, especially probably last week. But we are called more to even steward when we have excess. So let me explain to you. Last week I told you guys, uh, for more than a year, this church was not making its budget every month when we launched here. But thankfully, we steward the church in a way that we had savings that we were living off of. When we reached to the end of last year, we challenged this. One time in the church, you will hear one time for the year, we ask you to consider giving to this church. And it's what we call our legacy offering. Yeah? Those of you who've been with us, all that simply is, it's at the end of the year, we, we ask people to pray if you would consider partnering with Hope City and would you give an offering to that. That's our legacy offering. Once for the year, and here's what it does. It helps set us up for this year. So last year, December, November, December, this community sowed into our legacy offering. What people don't understand was because that gave us margin, instead of trying to go month by month, we were able to plan the health fair. That's why we are so precise when we say it's a legacy offering. Because what you sow into it enables the church to do something that doesn't stay within the four walls. So because of the generosity of this community, when our outreach team met, I said, okay, let's do the health fair. We have the book drive in August. Come on. For kids going back to school, we ain't, we not stopping. We didn't do it once. So we've been planning since last year for what we're going to do. When God blesses, what you do with the excess says more about where your heart is. Can I say how God works? So at the end of last year, coming into January, when I met with the team lead, I said, okay, we will move ahead with the health fair. Then we had some unforeseen expenditure with the chairs that you're sitting on. And we were in limbo of whether we would have enough to cover and do the health fair. Let me tell you how good God is and how he provides. They got the permission to do the health fair yesterday because of the generosity of many others, not just this church, but people giving, and I believe that's God. It did not touch the legacy offering. And you got to understand, that's how intentional We have to be with what God places in our hands. When we talk about kingdom first, that's what we practice here. 
Yo, you, I don't know if you all found it amazing, but it's only Easter we paint, we finish painting the back walls. For those who've been in, in here for a long time, right? And you would think buying paint ain't that expensive. No, but it's the way that we should. Come on. The health fair was more priority. And as God blesses, then we do piece by piece. I love Spurgeon, and this is a warning for all of us. There are a great many men that know a little how to abase. So when you don't have, right? That do not know at all how to abound when you have plenty. When they are put down into the pit with Joseph, they look up and see the starry promise. And they hope for an escape. Listen to what he says here. But when they are put on the top of a pinnacle, their heads grow dizzy and they are ready to fall. My prayer is that as a church, as a community, you as an individual or even as a family, that when God blesses you, it doesn't take you away from him. I know we remember more the seasons when we in lack. But if you look at your life, if you're like me, there are seasons when God has been good that we do forget Him. My prayer is that we would pursue contentment, but through the power of Christ working in us. Amen? So whether you have lack or whether you have a lot, we're going to be contented as a church. Verse 15 to 18, Paul continues. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. Paul just threw a lot of churches under the bus there, y'all. For even in... Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Now look at verse 17, underline this, because this is, this is what applies to, to me now. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am ample, amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. You see those last phrases? Take note of that. The second point is, I think Paul is going to break down how we should give when it comes to honoring God. That's what I want to share with you because he actually talks about this. So he begins telling the church in Philippi that, you know, you know, you guys were the ones who were generous to me when no other church was supporting me. So he makes that clear. One of the things that I told you to take note of is he said, their gift that they sent to him was a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. The words that Paul uses here is a direct comparison or link to the Old Testament sacrifices. When God demanded that the, the, the church, well not the church, but the, the people of God sacrifice to him, the way it was described was a sweet aroma. It was incense to the nostrils of God. Paul is saying, your generosity to the kingdom is like the same. But I'll go even further and push it. Ephesians chapter 5, around verse 1 or 2, it uses the same terminology in reference to Jesus' sacrifice for us. That Christ's sacrifice was a sweet-smelling aroma. Paul is saying that the generosity of this church to the kingdom of God, because it's not to him. Don't, don't miss that. Even though they send the gift to Paul, it is not for him. It is for the kingdom work that he's doing. Paul is saying that that type of giving and that generosity 
is on the same place of giving worship sacrifice from the Old Testament and what Christ did for us. Don't miss that. When it comes to how we give and how we honor God, please recognize that your giving and your generosity is much bigger than anything or any person that you see here. It is tied in with the example of God, of how he wants people to worship him. And let me go even further because this is, I want to give you this guide. Whether you stay at Hope City or not, if you go to any church or you listen to any program, I want to give you some of the conditions that Paul gives us of what godly giving looks like in the church. Yeah? This one is for you, to protect you. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1-5. to Now, brothers and sisters, we make known to you the grace of God which has been in the churches of Macedonia. Do you know who he's talking about? The church at Philippi. So he's writing a letter to a church in Corinth, but he's talking about the church in Philippi. And listen to what he says about them. That in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave voluntarily, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints, and this not as we had expected, but they gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. A lot going on there. I just want to say, you know what? I look forward to the day when church looks very different. Verse 4 and 5, Paul describes giving within the church that looks totally opposite to the modern day church today. Paul says they were begging us, urging for the favor to be a blessing. Instead, you have pulpits that are condemning people to give money. Total opposite. Are you all with me? So let me give you some guidelines for your generosity. Paul says that even though they were facing great affliction, they had an abundance of joy. When you are given to the things of God, make sure that it is a joy to do so. Come on. There are lots of scriptures that I can bring for that one point alone. Make sure that there's freedom. He says that they overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. There was a freedom for them to give. Many of you know the, the experience and the feeling of sitting in a church where you felt obligated to give. Come on. Or you felt even as far as being condemned if you did not give. That's not godly giving. That's not giving that honors God. Come on, are you with me? I thought you all be shouting me down here now, you know, because I'm on your, I on your side right now, you know. I gain you some freedom because some of you will be supporting and giving to people and, and ministries that you don't meet this criteria. Some of you giving religiously every month or so, every week, but it's still with a weight. That's still wrong. Yeah, I know the popular pastor. I know that. They ain't going to like that. But, but this, is, this is the word of God. Paul describes the, the way that that church gave. And this is how he spoke about it. He says they gave according to their ability and beyond their ability. You know what that says to me? When you give to God, you give sacrificially. Jesus himself went in the temple and, he, and they, everyone was given. He said the woman with the two coins gave more than everybody else. Why? 
because it was all she had. Now that's not a principle for you to think that a preacher could tell you, give everything you have. And as is no. But it has to be beyond your ability sometimes. Come on. A lot of people give out of their comfort or out of their convenience. The way that we support the kingdom is that we give sacrificially. And the last part that he, he, he highlighted, they give voluntarily. You must, when you go to be a blessing in any form of generosity, especially when it comes to the kingdom of God, it has to be of your own will. It has to be of your own will. And that is something that the church, and I'm not afraid to say it, you know, we've lost our way with that sometimes. We've tried to bend people into this. That's why here at Hope City, we make no appeal for people to give here. I taught somebody when I say amen, but all right, I, I probably had to be more clear when I ask him, you know, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My team real bright. They said I was right. The notes. <laughs> Let me say this to you. Godly giving actually does more good for the giver than for the one who receives. When it's done, God's way. So whether you give to the kingdom of God or you don't give, you need to start asking some questions. So for those who give, is my heart right for how I'm giving here? If you think you're giving because that's what God will be pleased with and that's how you earn some sort of favor, then stop. Stop. We don't want that here. It is better you come to the maturity of your faith to understand when we give, we get to give. That this is an act of worship back to God. Because he's already given. I ain't going to sell it short either, you know. So I'll tell you, pause on your giving. If you are given with some string attached that thinks it makes you closer to God or more holy. But for some of you, you need to probably start giving. I love that response. <laughs> y'all, hey, y'all too funny. But it's the truth, right? And listen, I okay, you know. If you're new to Hope City, that's fine. Figure out if there's a church God wants you to first. But if it is, support the work. But I'll give you something that is a little bit of a safeguard for you. Philippians 4.17, Paul says, Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the profit which increases to your account. I want to say this to you. One of the things that we have established from the start of this church, and I said it at the beginning, I'll say it again. We never want to stand before you and personally need anything from you. Paul didn't just talk about what giving looks like from the congregation. He spoke from the example of his life. That when he speaks about this thing, it's not because he wants something from you. If you are under the impression or you are under the weight that your giving is because somebody up here needs it, then we have failed you. Come on. Because my journey is no different to yours. So if I stand here and there's lack in my life, I have to learn how to be content. You have to biblically think about this topic of generosity and wealth when it comes to the kingdom of God. Not just if you give. But where you are given as well. 
Because I don't know about you, but I've sown into some ministries and into some lives that, that weren't right. I've made that mistake. And I'm trying to help you. Because if it's one thing, the idea of generosity is all throughout the scriptures. So it's not a question about that. But it is a question about how do we do it the right way that honors God. Paul's example here, if giving becomes about personal gain, then it's not a place to give in to. So, don't worry, this pastor won't be asking you to raise funds for a private jet. <laughs> or a car. If God don't provide, I'll find a way. I used to travel in my school days. It's, we do what we had to do. Now, y'all, 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 y'all need to understand. Y'all need to understand. Because for some of you, you want to know why God hasn't been blessing whatever, because maybe you've been sowing in the wrong places. Let's close off. Philippians 4 verse 19. And here's the... Here's the catch for this entire message. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And he closes off with his greetings. The last point that I want to challenge you with. God's promise of provision is tied to our generosity and our maturity. Here's why I can say that. It's tied to our generosity and our maturity. The amount of pages turning right now, eh, y'all? I didn't know we give all this so many notes. <laughs> so listen. God promises to supply all our needs. But notice that this promise was made to the Philippians, right? That's what we've been talking about for the past eight weeks. Those who had surrendered their finances and material possessions to God's service. That's their maturity. And who knew how to give with the right kind of heart. That promise that Paul that a lot of us hold on to. God will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Hold on to that promise, but understand the context. He has just broken down. He has just broken down an entire letter of a church that has been generous, that he has challenged to be mature in their faith, and to walk upright. Because the context is not a chapter. The context is the entire letter. Come on. You can quote that scripture how many times you want. But if you're not generous to the things of God, that ain't your promise. If you, even if you are generous, but you are generous thinking and believing some of the silliness that people preach today. That if you give to God, he, is, he has to give back this way or that way. That's not your maturity. That's your illiteracy to the Bible. So God's promise of provision is tied not just to generosity, but your maturity in your faith. Will you walk according to the profession of your faith? Will you believe and trust God? Will you learn to be content whether you have much or little? See, we just went through all of that. We love the promise of provision. But we separate it from what has gone before. But I can't preach that any other way for you. Especially if you've been with us through this walk, through with this book study. You have seen a letter written by the Apostle Paul for a church that was doing well, that loved well, served well, 
even handle their issues well. That's a level of maturity that the church has to come into. So it's not just about giving. It has to be with, tied with our maturity in the faith. Luke 6, 38 says, Give and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. The word of God says, By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Simply meaning, if you are not generous, God is not going to put more into your hands. You see, as real bash the prosperity preachers, you all know that from day one. However, the principle remains true. That the more that you give and sow into God's kingdom, is the more God takes care of yours. It's, it's just the principle. And I can say that from a place that I believe I've communicated enough for you. That I don't need anything from you. That I could stand in honest conscience here today. And say that your giving unto the things of God is more for your account. Than for anything here. That's why those who gave in the legacy. Even if you showed up yesterday or not. You had a part in it. For every life that was changed. Every seed that was sown for the gospel of Christ, your hands were in that. That's how we believe the church should operate. But I am believing God for you as we close off this entire series. That you would understand God still provides. And if you would still your anxious heart for a little bit, instead of facing Monday morning with the same rush and hustle and, and intensity to go and get more, that if you would pause and recognize, he's been faithful. And if he's been faithful before, you'll be faithful again. Put your trust and your hope back in the one who provides come on give up your right and your strength to, to be providing for yourself he does a better job than you and I when it comes to giving C.S. Lewis says this the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare our charities should pinch and hamper us if we live at the same level of affluence as other people who have our level of income, we are probably giving away too little. You all get vexed with him, yes? Not me. <laughs> That's why I like to bring these. <laughs> I ain't lying now. I just bring these old dead men so that <laughs> all they can't find fault with I now, right? But there's lots of wisdom in what he's saying. Here's the truth. None of us could outgive God. None of us could outgive God. This is not the topic the church at large has done well with. And I'll be honest, for us as well, I think we have not done too well. In the simple sense that we've known people look at churches as always wanting something from them. And we have tried as much in communicating and the way we operate, the way we live to show you that that's not who we are and that's not what the church is. But where we fail is to show you that giving into the kingdom is a mark of a transformed heart. It actually speaks volume of who you serve. It is a part of the mature Christian. So, i got one takeaway for you. Examine your life when it comes to wealth and the kingdom of God. For some of you, you got to examine that whole area of contentment. For some of you, you got to look at the way that you give to the kingdom. If it's really out of that joy, that freedom, or maybe you've just been doing it through 
some other means. Some of you might have to look at it to start. Some of you got to look at wealth and the kingdom of God to start remembering that God has it all already. That you can trust Him to provide for you. Amen? There's one thing that, that really hit me when I was preparing this. Please take the time to reflect on that application. It cost us something to bring this word to you. And I'm asking you that this week you would start to do the hard work of examining your own life. I don't know you, I don't know many of you personally, and even those that I've known for even some time, I don't even have the intricate knowledge of how you operate or how you deal with some of these things. It has to be a conversation between you and God, amen? And here's what I can tell you. The reason I can preach this boldly enough about being generous is because God has been the one most generous to us. No matter what you think right now, no matter what you've struggled through or even some of the church abuse you've been through, it does not diminish the extravagant gift that God has given to you and I. And that is the salvation from the crucifixion and resurrection of His own Son. So we can talk and struggle all we want about wealth. But we've been given the greatest gift of all. And that is salvation in Christ Jesus. Come on. So even if you're in lack, you got something to celebrate. Even if you don't have much. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You got lots to celebrate and rejoice today. And that is the good news that we stand on. That's the good news that we talk about generosity from. Because God has been good to us. That's why those who call Hope City their home, we give as an act of worship. Because He has first given. Amen. Come on, bow your heads with me. Let me just pray for us quickly. Heavenly Father, I just thank you today, O oh God, for your word, O oh God, and for your goodness on our lives, Lord. For God, you are truly faithful. You've been faithful and you continue to be faithful, O oh God. God, I pray for the hearts and the minds of this people, those in-house and those online, God. That, Lord, they would begin to trust you again. For those who've struggled with, God, where... Uh, this piece of provision will come from this area, oh God, that Father, in this moment, more than my voice, they will begin to hear and experience your love, your security, your assurance that you have their lives in your hands, oh God. And God, as a community and as a church, oh God, we will put our trust and our faith in you as our provider. Not just for finances. But God, you will provide healing. You'll provide strength. You'll provide protection. You'll provide, oh God, peace, oh God. Whatever we need, you are the God who provides. And so, Father, we put our faith and our trust in you, oh God. God, for those who you are speaking with that need to give their life to you, oh God. Father, I pray and I thank you, God, for the gift of salvation. And God, in that place, oh God, we commit our lives back onto you, oh God. And when we say our lives, God, not just the spiritual, but everything that is within us, oh God. Everything we own, everything that we have. God, our, inter our, our intellect, oh God, every single part of our being, oh God, we give back to you. You gave your best gift to us, O oh God, that is salvation. All that I am, O oh God, we give back to you, Father. I pray that as a community, as a church, even those visiting online, God, 
that we will make that recommitment and those who need to make that commitment even now that God we give you our entire lives oh God every area oh God holding nothing back to you oh God for God we know oh God it is in obedience it is in that walk with you oh God I trust that faith oh God that you will be the one that provides for us oh God cover us right now oh God seal your word in our hearts in Jesus name we pray amen and amen come on just a couple quick announcements before I get out of your way uh, next week we start a brand new series and coming out of Easter we had a couple salvations we also had a couple people who followed God in water baptism yeah man we celebrate those things around here because of that we're going to go into a series the call of discipleship and we want to give everyone their next step and let me say this to you that was the heart behind doing this series along with some other things but I want to say this to you if you've been in church for a long time you probably need to hear this more than anyone. Here's why. As a pastor's kid, I could see in my own life many seasons where it is easy to take for granted the way that we serve or follow God. Sometimes we do it more of our tradition, convenience, or comfort more than the way God has called us to. So I think it's a beautiful place if you want to be with us. We're going to sharpen each other. We're going to go deeper together in our walk with God. Amen. For those who just gave their lives to Christ, it's a great place to even learn what is your next steps.